All right, it's September. Beta Flight 4.1 is scheduled to be released on October 1st. So we're about to see some release candidates coming out for testing. So what is coming in Beta Flight 4.1? Let's check it out. So if you ever want to see what new code is being worked on in Beta Flight, all you have to do is go into Google and type in Beta Flight GitHub. The search results going to give you the top link. Once you're in the Betaflight GitHub, go into pull requests. A pull request is when somebody does some new code and they want to ask the formal project, Betaflight project, to pull that new code into the project. So that's a requesting for that new code to be pulled in, hence pull request. This would be all the active pull requests, but we want to kind of see what's in a milestone. And then also we want to sort these out by these labels. So we're going to hit milestone, hit 4.1. And we also want to check out a label type most of the time, the features that you're really interested in are minor features, major features, and just improvements. So we're gonna type in minor features first. You can click that here. The next thing we want to do is take out this is open because we really wanna see if it's open or closed. So a closed pull request is when it's already been merged in and it's already in the code. So you can see that sorts this list down and now we're left with an abbreviated list. So one of the big things that's coming in Betaflight 4.0 is Feed Forward 2.0. So that's just the name for it, but it's code improvements to Feed Forward. One of the difficult things with Feed Forward that we talked about in the PID tuning principles is as you increase Feed Forward to really track set point, you tend to get overshoot because you're really having a high rotational rate. You can use Daemon and kind of turn that into D-Boost to compensate for that. But there's some other tricks up the sleeve to do that really without Daemon as well, or less reliance on Daemon for that overshoot control. So you can see this was drafted up by Joe Lucid, worked on by CTZ and Balant. And a product of this code is kind of what you'll see here in summary. You're really not going to get overshoot anymore with just increasing feed forward values. You don't even have to really mess with Daemon as much. So you could really turn Daemon off or use that just to lower your Ds or use it to boost in prop wash. But you don't need the Daemon to kind of boost up your D gains to suppress overshoot. Inherently just raising feed forward, it compensates for it in a different way. It kind of sees the max value or the max rate of rotation. I'm gonna do an entire video on feed forward 2.0. So look for that coming here in the near future. A couple other items we see here are a new protocol for Spectrum, and I believe that DJI is using this same protocol, but I'm not exactly sure on that. More to come on that. As we talked about in the JESC, there is a protocol support for BL Heli S and RPM. Uh, in addition, the RPM uh, protocol for communication bidirectional is turned into an inverted signal, what they call GCR telemetry. Uh, it's a little safer, a little bit more stable, so that is in 4.1. Here's a new thing, uh, dynamic idle improvements with RPM telemetry. So right now, when you're in D-shot or in multi-shot, uh, multi-shot's kind of old, so we're primarily just going to talk about D-shot moving forward. But in D-shot, you have the, the D-shot percent idle. And what that does is it just takes and just adds like a little bit of throttle to the bottom of the commands going out to the ESCs to kind of keep it at a minimum throttle amount. But kind of the downside of that is that when you go to zero throttle or when your ESCs go to, to do braking, you've kind of lost that 5% of braking torque at the bottom of the throttle band. Whereas this dynamic idle management using RPM telemetry data, so you have to be on JESC or BL Heli 32-bit ESCs that are running the RPM telemetry information, you get that 5% back for the braking torque. Okay, so we're gonna erase that. We're gonna go back up here to tags and we're gonna go into improvements. So we'll click on that, RN improvements. If you don't get something, uh, just make sure that you don't have two different types of labels you're looking for. Just look for one type of label. On uh, this one, we are gonna have some increase to I term defaults. So go into that PR. And then we can click on the file changes here to kind of get a gist of what we're looking at. So right now, the, the defaults for 4.0 are 60, 70, and 80. That's going to be bumped up to 85, 90, and 90. Uh, just with the realization that, you know, Feed4 2.0 is improved, so you're going to be able to get tighter stick tracking, so you're not going to get iTerm wind up. 
uh, as much. And then also we have that I term relax in there as well. If you do have any I term windup, that the I term relax would um, see that and then shut off I term during a sharp flip or roll. Really, a high, good high eye gain is good for racing conditions where you have sweeping turns or your quads off balance or, or things of that nature. So, so the default has been increased a little bit. Uh, obviously, if you don't like that, you can bring that back down to 4.0 or 3.5 or whatever eye term values you personally like, uh, but the defaults will be increased a little bit. Same for feed forward. You can see feed forward defaults have increased into the 90s. So we click on that PR, go to file change here as well. You can see it was 70, 75, and 70. Now we're going to 90, 95, and 90. Honestly, uh, I think those are still low. I think uh, really 150 is the start. Feed four is a, a, a gain that you can really have a lot of differential in. Uh, I've run feed forward gains up in, for my really heavy quad, 725 grams. We're up around 300 to 350. So uh, don't be scared to really take feed forward gains up as high as you want. Right now they're having the defaults just go up to 90. Still conservative in my opinion, but I, uh, crafts are getting lighter. Really is depends if you're into racing where your crafts are ultra lightweight or if you're more into freestyle where they tend to get heavier or grow pros, things of that nature. This is a nice one right here, the gyro filter restructuring. So I'll go into that. This is refactoring done by Bruce. This will enable the dual gyro board. So you have the sensor fusion where it has two gyros on it. Those in the past were not working with RPM filtering because each gyro uh, was running in separate banks to be filtered and then they were combined after the separate banks were filtered and everything was worked through. Uh, Bruce refactored that so the data, the raw data is combined and then it goes through the same filtering path as any other board. So it enabled the dual gyro sensor fusion ones to be able to work with RPM filtering. So that's a nice one. Uh, some YAL default changes. So we go into this and go to change files. And you can see YAL was P35I of 100, that's being changed to P35I of 80, and feed forward will be on by default of 70. And I think that was then increased to 90 in a later pull request as we saw before. Smart feed forward is being removed, like I mentioned before in another video. Uh, so that is out of there. Another change is the filter defaults, which we'll show here in a little bit with some configurator changes that are coming. So more reliance on PT1 filters. It seemed like with Betaflight 4.0 that the switch to defaults on being bi-quad, uh, although bi-quads attenuate high frequency noise a little bit better, that there was still a lot of, I guess across the board, uh, when you're looking at all the crafts out there, a lot of uh, noise on crafts between 100 and say 200 hertz, where a PT1 filter attenuates that a little bit better, uh, has a, a kind of a shallower slope. So it's, it doesn't attenuate up high as much, but the roll off where it, it starts to attenuate more is a shallower slope. So it's not this doesn't attenuate, doesn't attenuate, and then bam, really starts to drop down in its curve to start to attenuate the high frequency stuff. It's kind of a smoother roll off down. So you get more attenuation in between the 100 to 200 Hertz range. So anyways, you'll see the defaults for 4.1 reliant on dual PT1 filters on all the filters. And we have some uh, cool things coming in the configurator as well to work with that. Looks like kiss rates were added. I'm not too sure on that. So you can check that out if you are into that. Whenever you're looking down through these and you see this uh, distance to CMS or when you see it to MSP, CMS means that you're going to be able to access it then through the on-screen display. That's what the CMS means. Uh, MSP means it's passing some data now or it's making a variable exposed for the configurator. Something's probably going to be coming in the configurator to adjust variables, things of that nature. So you can see here there's a ton of H7 support uh, being added to 4.1. Uh, some daemon again CMS is going to be available in the on-screen display there through various uh, PRs as well another big thing is VTX tables is added into 4.1 so right now when you're using the OSD to adjust the VTX settings or using the Lua script on your Tyrannus you have to basically go by the defaults that are hard-coded into there that may or may not work with your VTX uh, you know, where, where it says 600, that really might be 800, so on and so forth. So no more of that. Uh, you're going to be able to put in a custom VTX table specific for your video transmitter and adjust it however you'd like. 
Um, you can even restrict the bands and channels so you don't have, uh, you know, if you're only ever using race band, you can just only put in race band and you can just select through that. So things of that nature. So there's a bunch of entries here. If you just type in VTX tables and set it to 4.1 milestone, you can see that. So those were kind of the, the bigger things that I kind of saw. Let us know in the comments below what I missed, what you think is a big feature that I should have covered, and I'll make sure to follow up on that in a future video. But before we go, let's take a look at the Betaflight Configurator, some stuff that's in the works and some stuff that's going to be in it already. So the Betaflight Configurator has been receiving some attention for this next release, which is really nice to see and, and appreciate all the volunteers going into coding and working on the Configurator. So as we talked about under VTX table, so if you go to video transmitter, you can now see a, a tab here where you can adjust your video transmitter settings. Now, when you just load it up for the first time, it's not gonna have these settings in it. You will need to do a paste to get it set up for the first time. So what you'll need to do is go just to go to Google and type in Betaflight VTX tables, and you will see a link that will take you right to this wiki, and you can take a read down through it they want the cliff notes of it, you're really going to come down to complete examples here. You're going to, you know, what, what kind of protocol are you using? You're using IRC Tramp, you're using Smart Audio 1, Smart Audio 2. You're going to grab this code here. You are going to go ahead and hit copy. You're going to go into the CLI, just paste that in, type in save, and then you should be able to go in and see it all set up here. Uh, for you to use. You can make the tweaks in here now instead of the notepad, uh, which might be a little easier. And you can, like I said, you can just reduce this down to two and then just set this to 50 milliwatts. So that's probably the, the easiest way, honestly, to make the tweaks instead of messing with notepad, things of that nature. Uh, so that is a pretty cool little thing. Finally, there is a drop down in black box, the black box tab here where you can select your debug mode. So we always want to see gyro underscore scaled with any logging. So you can see the raw noise of the craft and then after it's filtered. So you can go ahead and get that all set up and then hit save and reboot. Something that's being worked on, I hope, and I hope we'll get into here is the uh, RPM telemetry would show up right on this screen. So right now, to once you get our PM all set up per the wiki, you have to go into the CLI and type in D shot underscore telemetry underscore info, and it will display all the RPM data. I just have a, a board here that's not even hooked up to a quad here, but it would display all the RPM data so you can see if the feedback's right with the motor spinning, but it's a, it's a little bit tricky because you got to have the props off. You go in the motors tab, you make the motor spin up ever so slightly. Then you come to the CLI, type that command, and then you can see the data reading back and you know everything's okay. It's kind of a little bit of a pain. It would be nicer if just the data would just show up in the motors tab. So I believe that's on the radar and hopefully that gets into the configurator for the 10.6 release. Some guys have been working on PID tuning sliders for the PIDs tab and the filters tab. So special thanks to everybody that's been working on this. I've been involved in this as well. Um, but if you go through this and I'm not sure at this point if this will be in the uh, configurator 10.6 release. You can see this is says 10.6 up here because this is a branch build for the PR itself, but it may be posted for 10.7, which would be another six months from now. But in either case, it's stuff that will be available out there, even if it's not in this main release of the configurator or not, that uh, people can start to use. One of the nice things that we're doing here is just if you go through some of these tool tips, we tried to make them layman's terms. So I believe the tooltip before talked about the derivative recovering the derivations from the PID loop, which I'm not even sure exactly what that means. Uh, tried to get these more in the layman's terms of what they do and how to think of this, like the P term is the spring on your car and the D term is the shock absorber on the car. That's kind of how they react and work with each other. So take a look at those for tooltips and tuning. Uh, some other things, and I'm going to do a whole video on this, but um, you can use the master slider to move all the PIDs up or down. And the key thing there is they're proportional to each other. The PD balance, uh, that changes the PD ratio. So, so you can see in this one, the D terms are held, but the P terms move up and down. 
uh, the PD gain, where now you're moving the P and D terms up together. Recognizing the P and D terms work together to push against prop wash, you can raise those both at the same time. And the big thing here as well is as you're moving these up, it keeps the same proportional ratio that you had set prior uh, with your PD balance as it's sliding things up or down. That proportional ratio to everything is a big deal. Uh, that's what we miss. We think about like, oh, if I'm gonna bump up my D term, you know, five, I'll pump up my P term five. It's like, well, that's not how it works. You really need to bump up your P term by like 10. You just do the ratio in between. It's So anyways, these sliders keep the ratios as you're moving things up or down. And then uh, quad response really just moves your feed forward. Now these are meant for basic tuning, kind of the rough brush. You know, if you do want to have the ability to go into here and just make custom tweaks like you always could before, that is available. Of course, then the sliders gray out and you can't use those anymore. Uh, if you would, it would kind of set them back to the defaults or a ratio thereof. These sliders are based off of the current default. So if you go and make tweaks and customization, you're kind of departing from the sliders. But uh, my goal personally is I'm gonna to start to tune just with the sliders. Honestly, they get you close enough. These terms generally, you know, if you're moving up or down five or, you know, two or three points that don't really get anywhere. So fives and tens, think of that, think of it that way, especially for feed forward. That is a gain that is not very touchy at all. So that is a cool little addition uh, to the configurator. Again, check out the tool tips. Uh, hopefully that will explain what each of the terms do and kind of hope and hopefully navigate people through how to tune. Uh, essentially, you would go from the top down for a tuning. Of course, the same sliders are in the filters tab. Here you have a gyro filter slider, so you can take a look at these numbers here, and this moves this up and down in proportional ratio to each other. Uh, same thing for the D term one over here. Uh, generally, they'd stay around the same, but you know, if you want to um, get less phase delay, you know, less, less delay in the gyro signal, you would use less filtering. Um, but you know, there, it, it's a balance, you know, the less filtering you use, the more noise is going to go through the, the D term. Uh, again, I encourage everybody to take a look at these, read through these tool tips. They explain everything in hopefully layman's terms. Special thanks to IOV uh, FPV uh, for his work on this. He really did all the coding and uh, Chris Thompson and myself and uh, Bismar and some other people uh, for providing input uh, on how this all works and is set up. So if you are interested in flying Betaflight 4.1 release candidates, which should be coming out here in the next week or so, uh, do make sure to go into your configurator, check on this show unstable releases, expert mode, and then you would change this to release and release candidates. And then it will enable you to see any of the RCs coming up for your flight control board. So you'd see them down here. So you can even see these are the 4.0 release candidates. So you would see 4.1 release candidates up here uh, after you pick whichever board you want to flash to. Don't forget that going back to the Betaflight GitHub, if you go to releases here, you'll be able to see all the notes. So there would be great notes under here, just like there was for 4.0 for, you know, the what's in it, you know, do read through the introduction there and improvements with the upgrade, so on and so forth, and you can get the links directly to the PRs. My special thanks to everybody that works on the Betaflight community project, making these this software better all the time through their volunteer efforts. And uh, hopefully, you know, sometimes people ask, how can they thank the devs? And the biggest way to thank the devs is to first not complain about upgrades that they have made. Uh, if you don't like them, try to be constructive about it. Secondarily, if you do appreciate the upgrades and you do appreciate that, uh, their time, let them know. And the best place to do that is on the Facebook groups for Betaflight that you, you know, appreciate all the devs' hard work and the new features they're adding. And uh, again, my special thanks to all their efforts. I know it's a lot, especially in a volunteer uh, setting. I'll be going through these major features on a video-by-video -video basis, so look for that in the coming uh, weeks, month, hopefully. Not too long, not months. As we get back into the school season, and hopefully summer slows down a little bit. I do apologize for being a little bit more laggy on video uploads, but uh, summer is always a really busy time. Kids are off school. Uh, we're very active, stuff like that. So I try not to neglect my family and I try to get some sleep because I'm usually pretty tired by the end of the day. But uh, 
Thanks, everybody, and I hope this helped.